All right, so as we come into this next section of Matthew's Gospel, Jesus is going to teach his disciples the proper way to deal with Christians who are in sin. And as we'll see, this is a very important matter for all of us to look at, to understand, and to put into practice. Uh, we saw last week in chapter 18, Jesus started off this long teaching through the whole chapter by answering the disciples' question, you know, when they say, who's the greatest? They're talking about themselves. Who's the greatest in the kingdom of God? You know, we want to have a front row seat. We want to be sitting on thrones next to you, Lord. And Jesus answered and said to them, as he takes this little child, sets him in their midst, he says, unless you are converted and become like little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And so the answer to their question is, if you want to be great in God's kingdom, you need to humble yourself, you need to obey God's word, and you need to become like a little child. Learn to be the servant of all. But then Jesus warns about causing one of these little ones who believe in him to sin, to stumble, to be drawn into sin, to be abused. He gives a harsh warning for those who would cause little ones who believe in him to stumble. And that means little ones not only in age, but also young ones as far as the faith. When people trip them up and cause them to sin, Jesus says, hey, it would be better for that person to have a millstone hung around their neck, be tossed into the sea, the Sea of Galilee, 141 feet deep. And those of us that have been to Capernaum, you see those millstones there. They weigh hundreds of pounds. It would take you a few seconds to reach bottom. He says it would be better to have a millstone hung around your neck and tossed into the sea than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. So we see Jesus' heart for children as well as for new believers. We also see his heart for those who go astray because we, he talked about those who wander off, those who are led astray, those who just kind of get out there. It says he leaves a 99 in a safe, secure place. He goes after that one lost sheep because he loves them and he brings them back. He wants them to be in fellowship. So now as we pick up in chapter 18, verse 15, Jesus re reveals his heart toward those Christians who get caught up in sin and how we should deal with that brother and sister in Christ. And that'll take us to the, the rest of the teaching in this chapter and the importance of us forgiving those who have sinned against us. So we see a progression throughout chapter 18. Be careful not to cause weaker, younger Christians to sin, but if you do and you feel ashamed and you run away, know that the Lord's going to come after you because He wants you to repent. He wants you to come back to the flock. But then we must be willing to forgive those who have wronged us, even as Jesus forgave us. So look at verse 15. Whoops. He says, Moreover, chapter 18, verse 15, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, Go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, then you have gained your brother. But if, uh, So pause there for a moment. If he hears you, you've gained your brother. He's speaking of our brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and if they have sinned against you and if they have offended you, then you, me, we must be willing to go to them and let them know what you did was wrong, what you did was sinful, what you did was hurtful. But notice what Jesus says. Go and talk to that person alone. Just one-on-one, -on -one, you go to that person first. You don't go to Facebook first. <laughs> you don't go to all your friends. Yeah, that jerk, he said this about me. They did this to me. You don't do that. You don't, you know, Satan loves to get our emotions stirred up. He loves to get us upset. He wants to get people vengeful and angry. Jesus likes a quiet settlement. And so he says, you go to that person alone. They, be, they unfriended me. Oh, what can I do? How can I get back at them? No, our responsibility is not throw a pity party, not to gossip. Don't start a so-called prayer group that is nothing more than a sanctified gossip party. <laughs> And then notice Jesus says at the end of this verse, if he hears you, you have gained your brother. And so the goal is not to win an argument. The goal is to 
see your brother, your sister restored back into fellowship. See them restored. Reconciliation, that's the goal. We should also want to see people brought back into that intimate relationship with the Lord and with one another. The only exception I see to this first scenario, one-on-one, is a girl should not go to a guy one-on-one if they, he's done something, but take somebody with you, they, you know, stay off to the side, let them talk about it, but have somebody there. Because you don't know. We're living in a weird world. We need to have wisdom and discernment. A, a woman should not go to a man alone. A man should not go to a woman alone, but take somebody as a witness that can be there to stand by Again, there's too many wolves that are dressed in sheep's clothing, and sometimes you don't know if that person's an actual Christian or not. So be careful. If it's someone in the church, you can go into the foyer here and talk to them one-on-one. When a lot of people around, nothing gets weird. You can go into the fellowship hall. There's no reason why you cannot address somebody one-on-one. If you are heard and there's humility and repentance, praise the Lord. That's the goal. Now look at verse 16. But if you will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. Jesus is quoting from Deuteronomy, and he quotes more from Deuteronomy than any other book. But here he says, if the offending sinful brother or sister doesn't listen to you, they, they just kind of blow you off, they don't want to hear it, then take one or two more people, and I would say mature believers with you, then go to that person... And that's because some people will twist what you say. Some people will, you know, take your words out of context. So it's good to have a couple of witnesses who can verify what's being said. But if that sinning brother or sister is still unrepentant and they're still stubborn, they refuse to acknowledge their sin, verse 17, Jesus says, and if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. So this third step, bring it to the church. And I would say bring it to the church leaders. Bring it to the pastor, the elders. After all, this started off as a one-to-one issue that needs to be resolved. This is not an issue that you have to drag somebody up on the stage and humiliate them in front of everybody. That is not what the Lord is talking about. You don't put a warning in the bulletin, avoid this person because they said something mean to somebody else. No, again, this is an issue between two people. On the other hand, if a person is going around sinning against a lot of people in the church and we finally find out, we need to warn that person if they don't repent, then more drastic action takes place. If they're continuing to sin against others or if they're spreading false gospels, they're trying to split or destroy the church, If it goes unchecked, then it's like leaven. Paul says a little leaven leavens a whole lump, and so that needs to be stopped. This is what the Apostle Paul says, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 1. He gives us a very heavy-duty example of this. He says, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality is not even named among the Gentiles. So this is way out there crazy. And here it is, that a man has his father's wife. Yuck. That was my insert there. It doesn't say that in the original either. That's not in the Greek. But a man has his father's wife. He says, you are puffed up. He's getting on the Corinthian church because they're like, oh, we're so tolerant. We're so open-minded. We don't want to judge anybody. Oh, he's sleeping with his stepmom, his mom. Oh, Oh, we're open-minded about sin. And a lot of churches are like that. They don't care what happens. We don't want to judge anybody. And it's like, no, we have a right to. And here Paul shows us. He says, you're puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from you. Paul says, For I indeed, as absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged, as though I was present, him who has done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together, along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved 
in the day of the Lord Jesus. And so that is an extreme example of church discipline. I've never had to turn anybody over to Satan. We've only asked one person in 30, almost 33 years to leave the church. And that was 25 years ago or more. And so it's not what we're looking to do. The goal is always the same. You want to see healing. You want to see repentance, restoration, and reconciliation. And in this case, that Paul brings up here, the church discipline worked. The guy repented. But then the problem was the church wasn't willing to receive this guy back and forgive him. And so in his next letter to the Corinthians, Paul had to tell them, hey, the guy repented. It's time to forgive him, comfort him, restore him. 2 Corinthians 2, look at these verses, starting in verse 6. This punishment, which was inflicted by the majority, is sufficient for such a man, so that on the contrary, you ought rather to forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Therefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. So the guy repented. And I said last service that the guy was probably, because the Corinthian culture was one of the most wicked cultures in the world at that time in Greece. Everything goes, anything goes. And these new believers, they're probably thinking, oh, this is okay. Paul straightens them out. The guy repents now that he knows. I can't be doing that. So they said, now reaffirm your love to him. Again, that should be the goal when it comes to this issue. But church discipline fails if we neglect to use it, choosing rather to ignore blatant sin among the body of Christ, or we abuse it or turn it into sin sniffing. You know, a lot of people just like to go around sniffing out sin. They want to find somebody in sin. Well, that's not hard to do. None of us are perfect. We all stumble. We all fall short continuously. You are forgiven but nobody's perfect, and so we're not looking to, you know, mess people over, kick them out of the church. We don't want to hammer them with their faults and failures, but we want to give people a chance to get right if they've done something against you personally or against the body. But if it's done in a biblical way, Jesus tells us in these verses, then hopefully you've gained your brother back. And that's the goal. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Check this verse out. It's very important. Paul says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass or any sin, and he's speaking to believers there in Galatia, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Now again, it's not always possible to have reconciliation as Jesus says here, if that person continues to rebel, they refuse to listen to biblical counsel, a time will come when he says they'll need to be put out. You look at them, as he says here, um, as a heathen, as a tax collector. If you're in the IRS, I feel sorry for you. Um, in other words, a heathen is looked at as an unclean, unsaved person. A tax collector is looked at as a traitor. And so that's the context of what Jesus is saying about those. Look at them that way. Don't look at them as a brother and sister in Christ. If they refuse to repent, they're probably not even saved. So treat them as such. Verse 18, Assuredly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, this is a very important verse that we need to get right as to what Jesus is saying. First of all, he's not talking about binding Satan, binding demons. That has nothing to do with this verse in this context, even though a lot of our charismaniac friends like to take this verse and use it that way. Jesus is not talking about that. But you remember back, look at this verse in chapter 16, Matthew 16, verse 19. Jesus specifically said to Peter the same thing as he says here. He says, and I give you, speaking singularly, the word there in Greek, you, is singular, so it's to Peter, I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you, Peter, bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you, loose on earth, will be loosed in heaven. And we saw that Jesus was referring to the fact that Peter was given the awesome privilege of opening up the door of faith to Acts chapter 2, the Jews. 
Acts chapter 8, the Samaritans. Acts chapter 10, the Gentiles. And the key to open that door was the gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. And so Peter preached the gospel concerning Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. That's what would bind and loose what God's word says. Now here, when Jesus says, Surely I say to you, he says the same thing, but the word you here is in the plural. He's talking about all the disciples, including you and me. You and I have this same authority. He is saying to all of his disciples, he's talking about us, his church. The idea is the church has moral authority, and we are to stand on the moral authority of God's word. In other words, certain things are bound on earth because they've already been bound in heaven. Certain things are loosed on earth because they're already loosed in heaven. For example, sex outside of marriage is sin. Not because we decided it's sin, but God's word says this is sin. And we stand on that. So that's what he's referring to. The same is true of a lot of things. Idolatry. It's not idolatry because I somehow chose to say, oh, this is idolatry. No, God's word tells us what is idolatry. Same with abortion. I don't say it's murder because I think it is, but God's Word says it's murder, and we stand on what God's Word says. The same is true of gay marriage, polygamy, drunkenness. There's a lot of sins that are not political issues, but they're moral issues because of what God's Word says. So Jesus is teaching this in the context of church leaders disciplining someone who refuses to repent of their unbiblical lifestyle. So if they refuse to be reconciled to God's word, then whatever you bind on earth literally has already been bound in heaven because God has already declared, this is the truth of my word. And so we, are, we need to stand on that. The same is true with the word loose. When Jesus says whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven, it literally means what God's word says about repentance, restoration, reconciliation, forgiveness. We stand on that. We can tell people, if you'll turn to Christ and be forgiven of your sins, He'll wash all your sins away if you come to Jesus. If you um, tell that brother or sister that's in sin, hey, if you repent, come back. You, you can, don't have to be away from the church. God says they'll be loose from that. They can come back because you have repented of your sin, because Jesus loves you, because you are forgiven, you are welcome to come back into fellowship with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Again, this is moral authority based on God's word, so it directly is from the Lord. That also means the church does not have this authority unless the church is standing on God's word, because there's a lot of authority the church supposedly takes and makes proclamations that are not biblical. And then you get into legalism on one extreme where, well, you can't be here unless you've got your hair in a bun and you're wearing a long denim skirt and, you know, and it has to be Saturday. It's the mark of the beast if you're here on Sunday. No, that's going to the extreme legalism. The other extreme is licentiousness. Oh, you guys can live any way you want. God doesn't care. You know, you can sleep with whoever, you can get wasted, doesn't matter. You're covered by grace. That's the other extreme. That's not right either. We have the moral authority based on God's word, and we can say, this is what he says. Not my opinion, but this is God's word. I say that because some churches use their own standards. But when this is the case, church abuse will rear its ugly head and it causes a lot more damage than good. That's why we always say, you got to stick to God's word. You know, it's not our opinion. It's what he tells us. So look at verse 19. Jesus says, Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Again, the context here is dealing with forgiveness, dealing with those who are being disciplined. Anytime disciplinary action is required as church leaders, we need to be gathered together in the name of Jesus. What does that mean? To be in, to gather together in His name means you're gathered in His nature, in His character. That's what His name represents. We need to operate in the nature and character of Jesus according to the Word of God. 
That means we seek to have repentant people healed and restored, just like Jesus did with us. He has forgiven us of all sin. He has extended grace and mercy abundantly to us, and we need to extend that same grace and mercy to others. Again, the goal is restoring, not destroying. Where he says, if two of you agree on earth, that word agree is where we get the English word symphony. It's sumphonio, sumpho, yeah, sumphonio. That's the Greek word for agree. In other words, we need as leaders to be in symphony, to be in agreement, harmony, as it pertains to church discipline when a person is in sin. We need to address it the same way Jesus does, not to beat people up, but to challenge them, to get them to repent, to draw them back to the Lord. We need to be in the Word of God. We need to be in prayer so that we can figure out the will of God in these situations. It also takes humility. It takes honesty because we should always want God's will to be done God's way according to God's Word. Because that's the only way that we can gather together in Jesus' name, in His nature, and be in agreement with Jesus in our decisions. And so when people take this verse and try to say, hey, we're gathered two or three of us, we're going to claim that beach house in Maui. Praise the Lord. That's not what he's talking about. That's not in context to being in agreement when it comes to forgiveness and the healing, reconciliation, or putting them out of the church. Otherwise, we'll find ourselves like the church of Laodicea. Where was Jesus? Was he in the church of Laodicea? No because they were not gathered together in His name, in His nature. They were doing what they wanted, how they wanted. They were doing church their way. Oh, we say we're rich, we're wealthy, we're in need of nothing. And Jesus said, you don't even know, you're poor, miserable, blind, and naked. And He wasn't even in the church. Remember, He's on the outside. Revelation 3, verse 20 says, He's on the outside. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. So the bottom line is we should all seek to do life God's way. We should all want to do church God's way. And so whatever we do, we should want to do it for God's glory. It's not about us. It's about Jesus. He's the creator. He's the sustainer of life. He alone is worthy of all praise and glory and honor. Not any person, not any denomination, not any church. So look at verse 21. Jesus just gives this very important teaching, and then Peter says, verse 21, Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Now, this is a very interesting question by Peter. This tells us he's fixated on verse 15. Look back at verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. So here's Peter. Okay, Lord, if I go to this brother, he sinned against me, and he repents, he asks for, for my forgiveness, how many times should I forgive him? Up to seven times? Now Peter's thinking he's going to be very impressed with my answer. Because the culture, the rabbis in Israel, they would say, you can forgive up to three times, and then that's sufficient. So Peter's thinking, well, I'm going to say seven times. Jesus will probably say, well done, Peter. Flesh and blood has not revealed that to you, but my Father in heaven has given you the supernatural revelation. And I go, No, that's not what Jesus does. He's saying seven times? This is great. No, verse 22, Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times 7. Now, when he says that, I'm sure Peter was shocked. How can I keep track of that, Lord? Well, that's the point. We're not to keep track of others' sins against us. We don't keep track of forgiveness. How many times has Jesus forgiven you? Yeah, we can say, yeah, once and for all, yes, but he forgives us daily. His blood, 1 John 1, 7 says, the blood of Christ cleanses us daily. It's a cleansing. It's an ongoing cleansing, ongoing forgiveness. Jesus has forgiven us. How many times? I would say, I don't know, Lord, how many times you've forgiven me. I can't count that high. Exactly, that's the point. You can't keep track. 
1 Corinthians 13, Paul's chapter on agape love, he says that love does not keep an account of wrongs suffered. We're not to tally up. Okay, there's another one. There's another one. No. Jesus wants us to walk in an attitude of forgiveness. You know what the word forgive means? To give beforehand. Forgiveness. To give beforehand. You mean I got to give before they even sin against me? That just means you walk in an attitude of forgiveness. Your lifestyle becomes that of forgiveness. If you're going to hang around other Christians, you're going to have to forgive. And so instead of waiting till they mess up and then, like, okay, now I've got to forgive them, you just have that attitude of forgiveness. I know you're going to mess up, so that's okay. I already love you. I already forgive you. That's really good in marriage, isn't it? Have that attitude of forgiveness. You're not keeping counts of wrongs suffered. I mean, if Elizabeth did that with me, she'd be like, okay, 491, I get to smack him. 70 times 7. No. You walk in that attitude of forgiveness. This is what Paul says, Ephesians 4, 32. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, and here's the kicker, even as God in Christ Jesus forgave you. Again, that's a whole lot of forgiveness. 70 times 7. There's only one other place those numbers are used, 77s. It's in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, verse 24. This is the angel Gabriel speaking to Daniel. Seventy weeks, and it literally means 77s. Shabuah is sevens in the Hebrew. Seventy sevens are determined for your people and your holy city. When you look at it, he's talking about a 490-year period dealing directly with the Jewish people and Israel. They're, you know, what Jesus is going to do and so forth. But he says, seventy sevens are determined for your people, for your holy city, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. So Jesus is essentially telling Peter, you need to forgive everyone who sins against you until I set up my kingdom on earth. Until I come back and rule and reign. Then we'll be in our resurrection bodies and we won't be able to sin anymore. Praise the Lord for that. And all those people that have wronged you, if they're believers, they'll be in their resurrection bodies. They won't be able to sin anymore. It's going to be glorious. So again, Peter's not thinking, i got to figure out how to track this because I know I'm going to smack the guy on 490, but his attitude was wrong because Jesus is speaking of an attitude of forgiveness that we need to learn to walk in. Nobody is perfect. We all stumble. We will all mess up. We all bumble around at times. But like uh, Paul says in Romans 2 verse 4, or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering or patience, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? And so we should extend, extend that same goodness of God that he has poured out to us, to those around us. And he is going to use this parable now. The rest of this chapter is a parable speaking about the true meaning of forgiveness. Look at verse 23. Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. Notice the kingdom of heaven is like. This is a parable. It's like this, but this isn't exactly how it is. A parable simply means, the Greek is parabole, which means to cast something earthly along something spiritual, and the, that connection will give you some insight into what this spiritual truth is. When it comes to parables, we need to be very careful not to try to make a doctrine out of a parable because there's a lot of things that won't be doctrinally sound in a parable. He says the kingdom of heaven is like this. Again, it's not exactly this, and we'll see this as this parable plays out. This is an example for forgiveness. That's the main point. That's the main issue Jesus is dealing with. So he says it's like this. A certain king, he needs to settle accounts with his servants. Verse 24, And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. 
This tells us a couple of things. This king is immeasurably wealthy. We could not comprehend how wealthy this king is. And here's his servant who owes him 10,000 talents. Now, some versions will say 10,000 talents of silver. That's a lot of silver. One talent of silver was equal to 15 years of someone's labor. 10,000 talents of silver would be equal to 150,000 years of labor. That's what this guy owes the king. Again, impossible to pay back, kind of like our national debt. <laughs> but worse. And so the picture Jesus is painting is that this servant would never, ever be able to pay this debt back to the king. It's impossible. That is how it is with sinners like us. We can never, ever pay back, pay off our debt of sin that we owe to Jesus. It's impossible. Jesus willingly took all of our sin upon himself. He willingly died in our place. He willingly paid our debt in full. Look at this verse in Isaiah 53, verse 6. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. Isaiah goes on to say, And it pleased the Lord to crush him. In other words, instead of us being crushed because of our sin, Jesus was crushed for us. He took upon himself all the wrath, the judgment that we deserve for our sins. Verse 25. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and, that, and all that he had and that payment be made. And so with no means to pay back his master, the master says, okay, I'm going to sell you, your wife and your kids, and you're going to be just a slave. You're going to be locked up. Again, this is not doctrine, but it shows us that our debt of sin affects more than just ourselves. Our sin affects family members. It affects other people around us. Verse 26, The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Are you kidding me? This guy thinks he's going to pay back 10,000 talents of silver to the Lord, to the king. He, we, again, are unable to pay off even an ounce of our sin, let alone 10,000 talents of sin, debt. A biblical talent was approximately 75 pounds. So 10,000 talents is approximately 375 tons of silver. <laughs> and this guy is like, wait, be patient with me. I'll pay you back. Are you kidding me? You don't have 150,000 years. You're not going to be able to do this. Again, the Lord is immeasurably wealthy. He's holy. He's righteous. We are immeasurably sinful and depraved and unholy, and we can never ever pay off that kind of a debt. This is where that old hymn, you know, that old hymn comes in. We or he paid a debt that he did not owe, and it's because we owed a debt that we could not pay. So anyway, the master of this servant. He's moved with compassion. You see that in verse 27? The master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. Amazing. He released him, he forgave him of 375 tons of debt. He forgave him, he released him. Jesus is speaking of the supernatural forgiveness that he has given us. His forgiveness is complete. His forgiveness is based on his love and compassion for us. It's total forgiveness. And that is what Jesus has done for all of us. In Christ, we have been set free. In Christ, we are forgiven of all debt, all the debt of sin. He paid it in full. And as the Bible clearly tells us, that price that he paid was his perfect spotless blood shed on the cross. So what grace, what mercy, what love, what compassion 
Jesus has bestowed upon each one of us. And all that Jesus is talking about here has to do with Peter's question. Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him up to seven times? Pastor Chuck used to say, grace received becomes grace bestowed. Pretty simple. Grace received. We've received his grace and we need to bestow his grace on others. But now watch what this servant who had this immeasurable debt paid off. Watch what he does to his fellow servant, verse 28. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. A denarii is a day's wage. So you're talking about a guy that owes about a little over three months of wages. And so he finds his servant who owes him about three months of wages, and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. So here's a fellow servant who owes relatively an insignificant amount compared to his 375 tons of debt. This guy's just three months behind. Easily forgiven especially after the king has just wiped out your debt, you would think this guy would be so grateful. He would just say, you know what? I forgive you as well. Compared to what I've done to Jesus and what he's done for me in forgiveness, how could I not forgive somebody that has done something against me? Instead of having compassion and mercy on him, he takes him by the throat and demands payment in full. Again, grace received becomes grace bestowed. This should be an eye-opener. It is to me. I mean, I've been hurt by people over the years. I've had people do things, and it cuts deep. I'm, I'm human. In my flesh, though, there's been times when I'm like, ah, Lord, give me the okay. I want to take him by the throat. Jesus says no. He quickly reminds me, Jeff, remember what you did to me. I forgave you completely. I paid the price you could never pay. You need to let your hurt go. You need to let your anger go. Forgive others as I have forgiven you. And all he can say is, okay, Lord, thank you, Jesus. I mean, who am I to argue with him? I know, like I said last week, if I had a toilet paper, I didn't say it this way, a toilet paper roll full of sin, it would just go right up into the parking lot. All the sins. And he's wiped me clean. He's forgiven me of everything. How can we not forgive others who have hurt us? Whether it was a little thing, a big thing, in comparison to what Jesus had done for us, we need His love, His compassion. That's the only way that we can say, I can let this go. I can drop the anger, the bitterness, because I see what Jesus has done for me. So look at verse 29. So his fellow servant fell down. This is the guy that owes three months. He fell at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. That's exactly what the other servant said. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. Interesting. How do you pay somebody off when you're locked away in prison? Notice, though, it says he would not forgive him. It's not that he could not forgive him. It says he would not forgive this servant's debt. Was it pride? Was it his lack of love, his unwillingness that kept him from forgiving him? All of the above. Verse 31, So when his fellow servants saw what, he had, what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that he had done. And his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all the debt because you begged me? Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? Again, the Lord never expected us to pay him back. He forgives us fully, completely, freely. No matter how wicked, no matter how vile our sins may have been. And we have the audacity to say, well, I'm not going to forgive you because you did that stupid little thing against me. You said that thing against me. It shouldn't matter if it's a little thing or a big thing. We should be willing to forgive. That person, if they come to you and they say, I'm truly sorry, will you please forgive me? 
How could we possibly refuse to loose them? That's what it means. Free them from the guilt and shame that they've been carrying around for so long. And if they, maybe they are gone, maybe they died before they could ask for forgiveness, you still have to have forgiveness in your heart. You let it go. You give it to the Lord. He will take care of it. Verse 34, And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers. That's why I say you don't build doctrine on parables. Until he should pay all that was due to him. So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Again, Jesus is painting this picture of how important it is to forgive. And if we are his child, God is not going to torture us. But if we walk around with unforgiveness in our hearts, guess who's tortured? We are. We're tortured with bitterness, animosity, anger, hatred. We can become very depressed because we're not letting it go. If we don't forgive others, it'll eat away at us. And I've seen people tormented by this over the years, but when they can forgive others, even as God has forgiven them, oh, what joy, what comfort, what peace there is as they are released from that pain and bitterness.